if you would take a seat in an attitude of prayer. Let us go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you in the midst of our praises and our prayers, in the midst of worship, Lord, in the midst of being present as your sons and daughters, your church, Lord, that you have graced us with the presence of your Holy Spirit. We pray now, Lord, as we open up to your word in the Gospel of Mark, that you would reveal to us the way in which you have called us to follow you and to count the cost of what it is to be a disciple. We pray this in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. God is good. And all the time. Amen. Well, today we come together at a historical point for us as disciples right here in this ministry. For over 150 years, this ministry has upheld the Word of God, lived in the Holy Spirit, and clung to the salvation of Jesus Christ right here in Center Point. The amount of fruit that has come through serving the kingdom through this congregation cannot be counted this side of heaven. And today before us, we're going to have a vote at 1030. We'll direct the path for the next 150 plus years of the ministry right here. My prayer is that each of us would count the cost of what it means to follow Jesus. And it so happens to be that God wanted us to talk about that this morning in our Gospel of Mark study. Not knowing spe- specific dates or details when we set out in the Gospel of Mark Today, God would have us in his word asking ourselves in his statements on the Gospel of Mark chapter 8, verses 34 through 38. So that's where we're heading this morning. And if you would open up to the Gospel of Mark right now, if you have your Bibles with you, to chapter 8, these words will be on the screen as we get going. But before we get to our focus scripture and verses 34 through 38, we're going to talk about the context of what's taking place, of why Jesus is saying what he is saying. And I want to begin us this morning in Mark 8, uh, verse 27 through 33. Jesus and his disciples went on to the villages around Caesarea Philippi. On the way, he asked them, Who do people say I am? They replied, Some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. But what about you? He asked, Who do you say I am? Peter answered, You are the Messiah. Jesus warned them not to tell anyone about him. He then began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. He spoke plainly about this, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But when Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter. Get behind me, Satan, he said. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. As in this moment, Peter identifies who Jesus is as the Messiah. You are Christ. This is coming from the previous interactions that we've had with the disciples of not fully grasping or understanding who Jesus is. But right now, in this moment, Peter is on point. He gets it. You are the Messiah. Or at least, that's what it seems at first. Right after Peter identifies Jesus, Jesus himself transitions into what will and must happen to him. The Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the teachers of the law, and he must be killed and after three days rise again. Peter pulls Jesus to the side and begins to rebuke him. Here we see an insight of Peter. We see his feelings and his desire to follow Jesus as king, but not as a persecuted king. To be the 
attention and have the spotlight and have the attractive feelings, a good feeling, a look at me, I'm important, I follow Jesus kind of feeling. Peter's response to Jesus brings into the focus of the cost of discipleship. Verse 33, but when Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter, get behind me, Satan. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. We have to recall, as Jesus speaks those words to Peter, what happened right after Jesus' baptism? In the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights, being tempted by Satan. The last temptation, the Gospel of Matthew records, Matthew 8, verses 8 through 10. This is what it says. Listen to this. Again, the devil took him, that's Jesus, to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. All this I will give you, he said, if you will bow down and worship me. Jesus said to him, Away from me, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Satan doesn't want the cross, never has, never will. Peter wanted to follow Jesus in his earthly reign as king. Peter wanted him as king of Israel, but not a suffering servant prophesied in Isaiah chapter 53. He was ready to receive the glory of following Jesus as a disciple, but not ready to endure the persecution of what it might cost to follow Jesus. Peter has forgotten the words of Jesus on the Sermon of the Mount. In Matthew chapter 5, verses 11 through 12, Jesus tells us, Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Oh, how we can relate to have been bought into the lie of Satan, swayed by the tides of culture, listening to the crowds of creation rather than the Creator Himself. Remember what Jesus tells us in Matthew chapter 6, 19 through 21? Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moths and vermin destroy, where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where moths and vermin do not destroy, where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will also be. Are you and I clinging to cultural comforts are we afraid that if we do not accept immoral behavior, we will not be inclusive? Are we buying into the make-it-up-as-we-go theology? Are we giving in to the feeling of wanting it all as Satan offers Jesus? We see it alive and well today across every land and over every bridge, day in and day out. People are buying the lie of Satan. Why do we see evil running rapidly through the neighborhoods and homes, ruining lives each and every day? After all, if God is so good, if He is the true Savior, if He is, in fact, Christ the Messiah, why doesn't He just stop it? Well, the simple answer to that is, where have you and I placed God in our lives? Is God the number one thing in your life? Is everything you do, every act, every word, come out of the awe and glory and reverence for God the Almighty. And if it doesn't, we don't understand the cost of the cross yet. We don't have to look far to see all the God complexes that we have created and lived into ourselves, not just outside of church, but inside the church. Why believe in God when I can have the control and power? I decide for myself who I am, what I do, how I treat people, it is my opinion that I have to go home with every night and live with. I choose to see the world in this lens, and I'm going to do whatever feels good in my own eyes. Scripture, that old nonsense. You get what I'm saying. We can go on and on and on here. 
But upon deep interpersonal reflection and awareness of Jesus' words to Peter here, it cuts to the core of each of us, every single one of us. You do not have your mind set on the things of God. We have to see the core act of God comes in two forms. The first is the cross. The cross is God's answer to sin. The cross is not a universal get out of jail free card, live however you want. God has taken the cost. No, because of the cross, the person who chooses to believe their life is truly reborn in Jesus. And once that person is reborn, they look different, they act different, they are different. You know, it's interesting as I'm spending time in God's Word this past week and reflecting on my own journey and one of the most influential places of me to learn the faith, learn what Jesus Christ did for me was Summer Games University. It's a place that I accepted Jesus as my Lord and Savior. Years ago, the United Methodist Church would not allow that summer camp to become a United Methodist camp because they talk about the crucifixion. It's too gruesome Kids do not need to know or hear about that. The imagery is too bad. You're going to give them nightmares. So the camp said, that's okay. We're going to remain independent away from the denomination. It's truly a testimony of the cross, of what we see happening at summer games, and we see the struggle within the United Methodist camps and ministries because they won't allow the cross to be a part of their faith teaching. When we see the cross and what Jesus has done for us, we begin to look at life different. Everything we see, everyone you meet, is through the lens of the cross. We see our lives, the lives around us, the injustice and evil, all of it brought together in the death of Jesus on that old tree. And the second is this. Jesus rose from the dead. Death could not defeat him. God took upon himself all the sins of the entire universe, past, present, and future, and killed them. And came back to life, revealing to us an eternal relationship available for each of us who would ever believe. There is no stipulation, there is no requirement. If you would so believe in Jesus Christ, that's it. We like to confuse things and say, well, have you done X, Y, and Z? And, and are, are you right here, here, here? Kind of makes me think about that thief that was on the cross who didn't attend a Bible study, who wasn't taught prayer. But in that moment, as he hung next to Jesus, Jesus told him, I tell you this day, you'll be in paradise with thee. It's through his words and affirmation of who Jesus was on the cross. Do you and I, do we have that affirmation in our own lives? Jesus' eternal act of death and resurrection is for everyone, everywhere, and at all times. And brothers and sisters, that's what we're voting on today. We're not voting on money. We're not voting on a building. We're not voting on all of these other political, denominational things. We're voting on the truth and structure that Jesus Christ died on the cross for us. He rose from the grave and gives us eternal life. Amen. As we move into these next moments, these historical moments for this congregation, we should always know that Christ is on the throne. He is before this day. He knows the results. And in response... To what Peter is saying here, hey Jesus, I'll follow you, but whoa, whoa, you can't, you can't die. Jesus really digs in, and I want to share these words with you. Verse thirty-four of Mark chapter eight. Then he called the crowd to him, 
along with his disciples and said, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. Whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes in his Father's glory with the holy angels. Jesus is speaking to the crowds and his disciples who are very knowledgeable of the form of Roman execution known as crucifixion. The prisoner would carry the cross on the longest possible route so every person would be able to see in town. There's an image of the cost of what it is when you do something wrong. But it was in this image of submission to Roman rule that Jesus uses that imagery and turns it upside down. That the imagery of carrying the cross is to illustrate ultimate, ultimate submission required by anyone who would follow him. Now Jesus isn't against pleasure and he's not insinuating that a follower should seek pain. He's talking about the part we play in following him moment by moment, unashamed to do his will even when the circumstances before an individual is difficult or seem impossible. John Wesley has this to say about the cross. Let him deny himself his own will in all things, great and small, however pleasing, and that continually. And take up his cross, embrace the will of God, however painful, daily, hourly, continually. Thus can he follow me, that me is Jesus, and holiness to glory. To be in Christ is the willingness to lose our lives for the sake of the gospel. Just as the Apostle Paul says in Romans chapter 1, 16 through 17, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, because it's the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew, then to the Gentile. For in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last, just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. We live by the cross daily, not ashamed of what might happen to us, what we might lose in our possessions or in a status, but gain all the gain we have in Christ. Jesus doesn't tell us picking up our cross daily is easy. It is for the purpose and reason of following him. If we don't, our lives in the end seem but useless. But it is through picking up our cross to follow Jesus that we see what Christ has given us through his cross. Jesus wants each and every single one of us to choose eternity, to follow him rather than ourselves. Another way to put it is Jesus wants us to stop trying to control our lives and our destiny and let him direct and guide us. This is rational. He's the creator after all. He himself knows better than we do what life is about. He's asking for submission, not self-hatred. He asks us to lose our self-control and our self-centered lives and follow him. It's not a forceful action. It's a voluntary one that we must choose. Now, don't get this confused with uh, saying, oh, I can do this to be saved. Because you're not saved through your works. It is by faith and grace that you are saved, as we read in Ephesians, Galatians, and so on. But I want to end with the words of Jesus here. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit their soul? What can anyone give in exchange for their soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes in his Father's glory with his holy angels. You and I, today, right here, and every day, have to answer these two questions that Jesus is asking us. What good is it for someone to gain 
the whole world and yet forfeit their soul? Are you and I striving to gain the whole world by accomplishments, by approval, by acceptance, by social status, by the size of our house or bank account? The list and time can be checked and go on and on and on and on and on. Whatever list you have in front of you. And I'm just going to be blunt. I'm blessed to be able to help three families with a funeral in the next week. Every single grave plot is the same size. The same will go for you and I. God placed you and I here for a reason. Some scientists say that every person is a one in four trillion chance of being born in this time and this place. Biblically, we don't put a number on life, but we acknowledge and believe that we're here for a purpose and a reason beyond ourselves, which is God. The second question we must answer every day, what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? You and I can easily fall into the numb motion that we're in complete control. Sure, we have control of some of the details of life, but there's so much more beyond our comprehension that we cannot control. It is God who provides the answers to these questions in and through us. Pick up your cross. Submit to me. I hold your life in my hands, and by my hands you will be delivered through my vicarious act upon the cross. I have died so that you can live completely, not just now, but for eternity. How it was in the beginning and forever shall be. Brothers and sisters, count the cost of what it is to follow Christ. Here in a few moments, our actions, our hearts, our beliefs are going to help guide this ministry that God has blessed each of us to participate in for the next generation and the next generation and the next generation. The gospel doesn't change, it stays the same. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, Lord Jesus, Holy Spirit. We thank you, Lord, that you do not sugarcoat a thing and, and, and hit us straight where we need to, to know, Lord, and be checked within our, our souls and our hearts. Not just this day, not just tomorrow, but, Lord, our entirety. Who it is that we're following. Is it us or is it you? God, I pray right now in this moment, even, even as this vote is upon us, God, there is so much more taking place. There is so much more in the midst of your kingdom and reality. So much more that you are calling us to. And all of it starts with faithfully submitting to you to pick up our cross and say, yes, Jesus, I'm going to follow you. May you lead and guide me. For Lord, you are our creator, you are the alpha, the omega, the beginning, and the end, the everlasting to everlasting, in whom we seek refuge. God, we pray all of this and so much more in your name. Amen.